we're going to continue talking about hypothesis testing. Now we often talk about type 1 and type 2 errors, which are just about the most boring possible labels. But they're important. Statisticians are just not really interesting people, sorry. Since there are inevitably randomness in an outcome of a hypothesis table, this I have, sorry, hypothesis test, this little table might help. There are two possibilities in the rows. Either we reject the null hypothesis, or we do not reject the null hypothesis. Then in the vertical columns, we have two possibilities. Either the null hypothesis is true, or the null hypothesis is false. If the null hypothesis is true and we do not reject, that's a win. Good news. Alternatively, if the null hypothesis is false and we reject the null hypothesis, again, win. But on those off diagonals, oh poop, we've screwed up. If the null hypothesis is true and we reject it accidentally, that's a type 1 error. In our dice example, the null hypothesis is that the dice are completely fair. And rejecting it would be a case like, oh, my fair dice just happened to roll more sixes than I might have expected. And I say, oh, these are unfair dice, even though the poor things actually didn't do anything wrong. The other off diagonal is type 2 error. The null hypothesis is in fact false, but I don't reject it, even though I should. Back to the dice example, that may be a case where I've shaved one side. It's a slightly different possibility of rolling a six, but maybe only 20 rolls, I don't have a good power, so I cannot reject the null hypothesis conclusively. I can't say for sure that it's not fair. When we set a hypothesis test, we can choose a level of significance, the probability of making a type one error. That's where the choice of 5% comes from. We can control that part. We cannot control the probability of type two error. That depends on how close is the null hypothesis to being true. In our dice example, if I do just a little bit of shaving, maybe six is one percentage point more likely to come up. It'd take an awful lot of dice rolls to be able to recognize that. If I don't roll enough, I don't get enough data, therefore I might not reject the null hypothesis that the dice is fair, even though that's an error. As in all life, there's a trade-off. The lower we drive down the probability of type 1 error, the higher, therefore, type 2 error can become. Now often our tests are comparing samples. We might ask, is there a difference in the means? Asking if two means are equal is the same as asking if, when I subtract one mean from the other, do I get zero? Of course, they'll never be precisely zero, but we want to know if the difference in means is big. How big would the difference have to be for us to say that it's a big difference? To create that hypothesis test, we want to find the standard error of the difference in the means. With x bar 1 and x bar 2 representing the means of each group, standard errors, s1, s2, then use the formulas about linear functions and show that as long as they're not correlated, as long as these outcomes in the two groups are indeed independent, then the standard error of the differences is going to be the square root of the sum of the variances, not the standard errors, divided by each n. Sometimes you see other formulas, I think on Hawks they go through some of those. If we're willing to assume the standard errors are equal, you could use a different formula. But then that gives rise to the question, well, how do you know? Why would I think the means are different, but the standard errors are, are identical? That's kind of a strange or difficult question, assumption. Generally, it's more conservative to estimate each different standard error. Then the tests are going to be a little more conservative, trading off between type 1 and type 2 error. Another thing that commonly gets done in principles of statistics is you're shown how to construct a one-sided test so instead of saying, what's the probability that I could see a measure as big as x, where big is an absolute value, we ask the easier question, what's the probability that I could see a measure as big in only one direction? Only one direction. In those little pictures, that's the light purple shading, not the dark purple. Now I'm not adding together both tails, instead of using only one of the tails, the total shaded area is a lot lower in the bottom picture than the top. A one-sided test is not as rigorous. While it's formally correct to do that, for me personally, whenever I see a one-sided test, that raises red flags, it's kind of shady. It's usually admitting that the data is not that clear. I mean, there may be cases where the one-sided test is legit, but in general rule, it just feels wrong to me. 
In most, hy most hypothesis testing, there are three main methods that you commonly see. It's worth reminding they're all formally identical. We can do some mathematics to demonstrate. Either I calculate x bar and its standard error to see if it's greater in absolute value than some critical value, such as 1.96 at a 5% level. Or I calculate the confidence interval, which is 1.96 times the standard error, plus or minus, and see if that includes zero. Or I can calculate the p-value, which is the lowest possible probability that would reject the null hypothesis, and determine if that is less than my significance level of 5%. They're all getting the same place, they're all doing the same thing, but it can be somewhat confusing, because they seem different. But they're all the same outcome. One of the places where ordinary people most commonly see confidence intervals is in polling. Support for some policy or politician is given as level with a confidence interval plus or minus like two percentage points. Now we can figure out where they're getting that confidence interval from. It's actually easy since the fraction of respondents who answer yes, p is distributed binomial. So the standard error there is the square root of p times one minus p divided by n. Typically p is gonna be near 50% because most polls are looking at issues that are controversial plenty of people on both sides. An interesting poll is going to have a probability close to 50%. That's also where the standard error has its maximum value. So if we want to be a little bit conservative, then the standard error formula set p equal to 0.5. Then the standard error is going to be pretty much determined by the sample size. A poll of 100 people would have standard error 0 0.5 um, divided by the square root of 100, so that's 5%. If I poll 400 people, that's four times as many people. Square root of four is two, so that has half the standard error. If I want a poll to have a confidence interval of plus or minus 2%, solve for n in that little formula there. It takes about 2,400 people. You could shave that down a little bit. I'm sure people do, depending on how you round. But if you're in the polling business, then your pricing is basically determined by how accurate the client wants the answer to be. Client wants a poll, your basic question is, okay, how accurate do you need? Do you want plus or minus 2%? Then we'd have to find like 2,500 people to answer the poll. If the client would be happy enough with plus or minus 3%, then we could sample fewer people. If they want plus or minus 1%, then we're gonna have to sample more people. Typically costs scale up with the number of people who are polled. That's the business model right there. Now you should be able to work out this apparent puzzle, what I've called the devious poll. Overall, if I look at just the total sample, I can see the support in favor of some candidate is 170 people out of 300, and that's statistically different from zero at the 5% level. But if I have three subgroups, maybe these are people in neighborhood A, neighborhood B, neighborhood C, none of the individual subsamples are statistically significant which is a reminder that statistical significance is not linear. A p-value of 4.9% is called significant. A p-value of 5.01% is called not significant. I can produce weird, non-intuitive effects. Part of your stats education is drilling yourself to develop better intuition for how these things work and how some people might try to play you with that. Another sort of shady thing that people do is a series of tests. Every statistical test has some probability of error. The type one error is often chosen to be 5%. That means if you do several tests in a row, the second test depends on the outcome of the first, and the third depends on the outcome of the second, which depends on the outcome of the first, et cetera, et cetera, then your error is gonna be compound. With two statistical tests, if each one has a 5% chance of a type one error, then the probability of not making a type one error in either one is 90.25%. That nearly doubles the type one error. The test significance is no longer 5%. If I do three tests and my significance is nearly 15%, I've tripled it. 10 tests, the significance level is 40%. That just gets bonkers, it's completely terrible. The worst part is a lot of computer stats programs have automated routines test every group and subgroup to find a quote significant unquote difference. It's no longer actually the advertised statistical power. You're doing a series of different tests, so buyer beware.
Sometimes people do this knowing they're doing it wrong. Other times people do it and don't even realize the testing doesn't work quite the way that they want it to or think it does. I'm kind of down on CAN tests in general because I found for a lot of students, they're looking for a shortcut, but don't get the understanding of what's actually going on. I'll ask a question on an exam where the difference in the mean is completely the opposite side than what we'd expect. And yet, you know, students will go through and just plug in the test because that's what they're doing. They're plugging values in the formula, never thinking about. Computer is even better than you at plug and play. At no stage will the computer go, huh, that's kind of weird. R has plenty of CAN tests for t-tests and chi-square tests and all the rest. I'd be very cautious about using these too early in your journey. Shortcuts can end up taking longer. The final detail about doing hypothesis tests is with a small sample. Our test statistic for a mean is going to be x bar divided by s over the square root of n, where I'm estimating s. In a large sample, that estimate of s is going to be good enough. I don't have to worry. But a small sample, I do have to worry about that additional variation from that estimate. Now you're perhaps asking, okay, how small is small? Just like previous questions, how big is big? I say in small samples, you have to worry. Small, how small? For this case, we have a simpler answer. Typically, 30 observations is a small sample. More will give us significant, uh, sufficient degrees of freedom. If you're using small samples and the test statistic has a t distribution, you can see that in the picture. The t distribution depends on degrees of freedom, and fewer degrees of freedom has fatter tails. That changes the critical value. The normal distribution has a critical value of 1.96 to provide a 5% chance of type 1 error. That's the bottom row of the table. As you read up that table in the first column, it's 1.96 at the bottom if it's a lot of observations. But if you only have five degrees of freedom, that critical value will be 2.57. It's quite a bit bigger. From 30 degrees of freedom, then critical value is two-ish, which is you know generally close enough. It's just something to be aware of if you have a really small sample.